And that's what free fall is. It's free fall acceleration, which cannot be achieved unless there's nothing underneath the falling object. As, as a person is when they fall out of an airplane, by design, hopefully, with a parachute, uh, they go faster and faster and faster until one of two things happens. Either their clothing forms enough resistance that they've reached uh, terminal velocity, which in the case of if you don't have a parachute, that's what it is. But if you have a parachute, the resistance to your fall is what slows you. The building began to be resisted by what was left, was crumbling, was being crushed underneath. It's very important. Building 7, a controlled demolition. Tower 1 and Tower 2, a planned destruction, planned demolition. Uh, it's important that we uh, use the phrases that, that will bring us to our goal. What is our goal? It is the goal of the family members. It is the goal of, of those who wish to have the crime solved. A real investigation, a real investigation of the facts of 9-11, the facts that were evident on the day and the facts that have been discovered since. I'm a family member, a distant cousin of uh, Vincent Princiota and Sal Princiota, whose death is a direct result of the crime of 9-11. There are many more family members in 80 different countries. In Japan, 24 people were, were lost in the crime. All of us, as family members, have essentially one thing that we are asking the public in general. Help us. Help us to get a final, real, open, worldwide investigation of the crime of 9-11, an examination of the facts which have come to light in the years since the crime. Essentially, as they would say in Japan, we are asking, Taskete kudasai. Help us. Help us answer the question. Help us find the perpetrator of the crime of 9-11. Okay, that's about as clear as it can get. Now, he was talking about all the information that we've gathered since. Well, switch to camera one, and right here, this is a stack of books, and mo mainly in this group right here is the David Ray Griffin collection. Those are you know, so highly detailed and so highly footnoted that you could probably use some of this for actually prosecuting. But right here, this one on the very end that you can barely see is uh, the, the Terror Timeline by Paul Thompson. Now we're going to have a video by Paul Thompson coming up, actually the next one after the one we're going to show. Go to camera two. Okay. If your recorder's going, you can't possibly write down all these titles, but you should compile some sort of a reading list for yourself. Go to camera three, and, you know, once you start collecting videos, that's fine and dandy, but they're all stuck in your computer and you, when you're not watching them, and, you know, and they can disappear, and you can forget about them, and, but the books are there forever. Okay, go ahead and take me back to camera four. Now, I'll introduce the next clip where we've got um, another interesting one that just, it's the first time I've seen it was this week. And uh, it's, you know, it's been long enough since 9-11 that a lot of stuff is somehow slipping through the cracks and getting declassified and, sur you know, surfacing. And I don't know if this was in, in that category or if I just hadn't run across it yet. But this is uh, an interesting one about a lady who had a FLIR camera, that, you know, infrared like they use on helicopters. Uh, go ahead and play the cut, and I'll see you when we get back. September 11th, 2001, she was near the World Trade Center working for Jersey Infrared Consultants and happened to have a FLIR infrared camera, which she used to take these two pictures of the World Trade Centers before they collapsed. The first picture doesn't show much because the temperature scale on the camera was set too low. This thermogram was taken 10 minutes after American Airlines Flight 11 slammed into the North Tower. The temperature scale, which is displayed to the left of the picture, indicates that these flames are hotter than 120 degrees Celsius, but doesn't tell us their exact temperature. This picture shows the east side of the South Tower 15 minutes after it was struck by United Airlines Flight 175. This picture shows that the fires in the South Tower, which was hit second but collapsed first on 9-11, had fire temperatures of 
90 to 100 degrees Celsius on the outside, which is around 200 to 220 degrees Fahrenheit. Not anywhere near hot enough to soften or weaken steel. NIST agrees that most of the jet fuel would have been burned off in the initial fireball immediately after impact, and the rest would have been burned off in the first 10 minutes. We can see from these thermograms that fires were still fairly hot 10 minutes after impact, but cooled down significantly about 15 minutes after impact when all the jet fuel had burned off. There is absolutely no evidence to suggest that the fires in the World Trade Center were hot enough or long enough to cause a, any sort of structural failure, let alone a global collapse of the entire building. The woman in this photo was later identified as Edna Cintron. She can be seen standing in the impact hole of the North Tower waving. How could she be standing there and still be alive if this was the raging, steel-weakening inferno that we were told it was? These thermograms were given to the 9-11 Commission as evidence, but were never mentioned or used. Paint tests done on the World Trade Center steel indicated low steel temperatures, 480 degrees Fahrenheit, and they were also not included in any of the government's final reports on 9-11. The 9-11 Commission even tried to hide the fact that World Trade Center Building 7 collapsed at all by failing to mention it in their report, which was supposed to investigate everything that happened that day. I think you should do your own investigation into what happened that day. These thermograms prove that NIST is lying about the temperatures in these buildings, as does the paint tests done. Even if fire could bring down a steel building, which it never has before or since 9-11, we can scientifically prove that the fires in the World Trade Center were not hot enough to cause such a catastrophic, spontaneous, and symmetrical failure. Let's look at the Windsor Tower in Madrid, Spain, which burned for 20 consecutive hours. Which building has hotter, hotter fires? Which do you think is more likely to collapse? Well, guess what? The Windsor Tower didn't collapse. Here it is still standing the next day after the fires were put out. That building burned for 20 consecutive hours. The South Tower burned for less than one hour before it completely disintegrated. In over 100 years of steel frame building construction, no steel frame protected high rise has ever collapsed from fire. So for it to happen once would be a highly unlikely event it would be considered a unique event or a physical anomaly. For such a thing to happen more than once, you have to multiply the probabilities together, which means that the probability decreases exponentially. So the probability of three unique skyscraper collapses occurring all in the same place, all on the same day, is unfathomably low. It would have to be a miracle for that to happen. Well, I'm a scientist, and I don't believe in miracles, and I don't believe that multitudes of coincidences can exist without there being some sort of connection that can explain them all and tie them together. A conspiracy, if you will. But I don't want to discuss conspiracy theories. The truth will come out when we get an investigation with the power to subpoena witnesses and evidence that the perpetrators of this horrible crime have kept hidden from us. Let's get back to the science and the hard facts, the irrefutable evidence that will be used in this trial. Mechanical or structural failures always occur at the weakest point in a structure. Earthquakes, atomic bombs, and fires have all led to partial collapses of steel structures, but have never led to a global, complete collapse, except for the three towers that fell on 9-11. Fire is an organic process which moves around from place to place as it spreads and uses up fuel. Random fires and random damage from plane impacts can only cause random failures, not symmetrical failures. Also, as a large building begins to fall, it picks up speed and momentum in the direction of the failure. The, south, the, the impact of Flight 175 into the South Tower caused massive structural damage to core columns on the southeast corner of Tower 2, which explains why it leads to that side once the demolition begins. We know it had to be a demolition because if the building started falling over to one side, it would be very unlikely for mechanical, from a mechanical standpoint for column failure to suddenly occur on the opposite side of the initial of the structure, the opposite side of the building, because the World Trade Center was core was also built to hold ten times the entire weight of the structure above. At ten times over redundancy, I find it even more highly unlikely that any structural failure occurred at all, especially on the side of the building that wasn't damaged by the plane impact. NIST never explains the column failure on the northwest side of the South Tower. They use a computer model to show how the collapse could have initiated on the southeast corner and then say that the rest of the building just collapsed from some kind of domino effect, a, a pancake theory. Kevin Ryan of Underwriters Laboratories exposed NIST when they 
tried to lie about the UL steel tests that were done. These tests totally debunked the pancake theory. Kevin Ryan was fired from, from Underwriters Laboratories as a result of his honesty. NIST then produced the inward Boeing theory, which can be debunked using this simple thought experiment. Which will hit the ground first? Logically. It would be the one on with nothing beneath it to slow it down, right? But instead, we see the entire building on 9-11 cave in on itself and fall at near free fall speed. Page 305 of the 9-11 Commission report states the collapse time is 10 seconds. That's near free fall speed. Free fall speed would be a little over 9 seconds, so 10 seconds, pretty damn close. And from a physics standpoint, in order to accelerate an object at the rate of gravity, it requires all of the gravitational potential energy. This is, is the law of conservation of energy that energy can't be used twice. So there's absolutely zero gravitational energy left over to account for the pulverization of concrete or the destruction of 90,000 tons of structural steel that held this building together. There's absolutely no explanation for where that evidence from. A simple calculation yields nowhere near enough evidence to account for this much destruction from such a from fire alone and gravitational collapse. Gravi gravity could not have caused, had enough energy to cause this much damage. That energy had to have come from somewhere, so let's look at the possibility of controlled demolition. It would be impossible to use explosive charges on the upper floors without having some of them detonate prematurely from the fires and the plane impacts. However, thermite, a military-grade incendiary, requires a super-hot magnesium fuse in order to start the reaction so it could sit in burning jet fuel without burning up. Thermite also wouldn't explode and create the loud pops of a typical demolition. It would melt the beams and bring the building down the same way as a demolition but without the sound and without without a lot of the uh, evidence like tracing elements that would have been in, in RDX or, or some of these other explosives that would have tracing elements left over. So there are lots of logical reasons to use thermite. Let's see if there's any evidence for it. In the most recent NIST report on Building 7, they actually talk about using thermite and rule it out because they claim it can't be used to cut vertical columns. NIST fails to mention anything about nanothermites, which is a spray-on gel form of thermite. Look it up. You'll find it interesting to learn who has the patent on it. When Flight 175 impacted the South Tower, parts of the plane's engine landed here and appear to have ignited a thermite incendiary cutter charge in that corner of the tower, as molten seal can be seen dripping from a hole on the other side, still sparkling from the aluminothermic reaction. NIST has tried to claim that this was molten aluminum from the plane's engine melting, but as I've shown before, the fires were not hot enough or long enough to significantly weaken the steel or melt aluminum parts of an aircraft engine. Furthermore, molten aluminum is gray in color and doesn't mix with organics such as paper or carpet fiber or window curtains as the NST claims it does. Wien's law, which is a derivation of Planck's law of blackbody radiation, can be used to estimate the approximate temperature of an object based on the frequency or color of the light being emitted from that object. So even if this material was aluminum, they would still have to explain what heated it to over 2,500 deg degrees Fahrenheit to get it to glow orange-yellow like that. They also fail to explain the iron-rich microspheres found in the dust, and the FDNY reports that fires burned underground at the World Trade Center for 99 days. Please check the link in the description on the, to the John Gross video and ask yourself who's lying, him or the FDNY, who are reporting live from the scene. The guy who confronted NIST in this video sent him the NASA thermal images he requested, but never got a reply. NIST has clearly shown that they aren't interested in looking at evidence, only pushing propaganda for a policy agenda. More than likely, these con artists were given NIST credentials in order to use a respected institution to convey a bullshit story and have it accepted by members of the scientific community based on the credibility of the source alone rather than the evidence itself. Okay, Bush lied and people died. Well, you can replace that with... Obama lied and people died. See up here? Obama knows it was an inside job, and yet he was out there giving you that BS about Al-Qaeda killed 3,000 people and blah, blah, blah. That's why we're in Afghanistan. He's a liar, and everybody knows it, uh, at least on this issue. I'm just talking about this issue. You guys that are all anti-Obama for whatever your reasons, uh, you know, I like to have a, a legitimate reason to be against somebody, not just because... You know, I'm offended that a black man's a president, like some of you fools. But 
Anyway, I'm a little bit angry about this whole thing. We're in the ninth year, and what's happening? We're seeing this COINTELPRO operation going on, and people are going, meh, meh, Muslims are bad, meh, I'm going to burn a Koran. And we don't understand that Koran burning was 